Yeah, so in this relatively short video, I want to introduce machine learning with scikit-learn. You have seen scikit-learn before in the k-nearest neighbor lectures where I was working with a k-nearest neighbor classifier from scikit-learn. However, here I want to take a step back and introduce the library properly. And then um, after this short video, there will be a longer video where I will go over some of the aspects for yeah, preparing the training data set using scikit-learn tools that make that more convenient and more efficient than compared to what we have done before. And lastly, the last video then will again go over some of yeah, the cool concepts in scikit-learn where we can combine like the uh, pre-processing and um, machine learning classifier fitting and training and stuff like that using scikit-learn pipelines. Okay, but let's uh, briefly talk about machine learning with scikit-learn now. So we are right now here. Yeah, personally, I always refer to scikit-learn as the main machine learning library for Python. And that is because it's uh, yeah a relatively established library. It has a very large user base. It's really nice to use. And yeah, it's, it's just a great library. And as far as I know, it's also the most widely used machine learning library. So uh, one thing to note, though, is that scikit-learn is not, f not for deep learning. So for deep learning, we have other libraries and deep learning is a separate topic that I'm uh, teaching in stats 453. So here we're not talking about the deep learning capabilities. It's just a machine learning library. However, it's probably one of the best designed libraries I know. So I also usually refer to scikit-learn as a showcase library for implementing yeah, a good API and a good Python library in general in Python. Because what's really great about um, scikit-learn is that it's very consistent and it has a very well thought out way of using it. Everything is compatible to each other and um, yeah, you will rarely find any bugs in this library and so forth. So yeah, it's, it's a great library. Um, and it's also already relatively old. So it was initially released in 2007. It was like 13 years ago. It's a long time ago. However, that doesn't mean that it's like um, dated. It's still very much up to date. A lot of people are contributing it, uh, to it. So originally it started as a summer or Google Summer of Code project by um, David um, Cornepo. And uh, later on, other um, contributors joined. So later on, Lots of people started contributing. So I was just checking on GitHub. There are more than 1,875 contributors now for scikit-learn. And um, it's used by uh, almost 150,000 people. So it's a huge library. There are lots of efforts that go into it. And you can really see that based on the quality of their code. So yeah, here's the link to the official website where you find the documentation and tutorials. And I think this is maybe yeah, the one main paper, if you use that later on in your research project, would be nice to, yeah, to cite the library. So um, that's just a yeah, common convention in academia. If you use a software library, don't forget to cite it because people put a lot of work into it and it would be yeah, also nice for them if you cite their library. Yeah, so here is an uh, overview of the scikit-learn estimator API. So with estimator API, I mean, APIs for regressors, like regression analysis classes and classifiers. So we call them in scikit-learn regressor, regressors and classifiers. These are the main types of classes for supervised learning. So this is um, for supervised learning. And here, this doesn't actually exist. So this is just some code that um, explains the main concepts of the estimator API that goes back to the object oriented programming paradigm that I explained in the last video. So the main aspects of any classifier or regressor are listed here. Here, try to abstract that a little bit. So what you, uh, how the supervised estimator usually works is that you initialize it using certain hyperparameters and the hyperparameters they get assigned in the constructor here. So this is usually you don't see that part. You just provide the hyperparameters and there's some thing going on in the init method and that will yeah, uh, create the object. So when you have something like, uh, let's say my new classifier and you initialize a k uh, neighbors classifier, then 
I'm running out of space, so I'm writing this on a new line. There will be hyperparameters like n neighbors, can set it, for example, to three and stuff like that. There are usually multiple hyperparameters that you can set. So that is one aspect of, of course, the <laughs> supervised estimator API. And the hyperparameters, um, they get assigned here in the initial, uh, initialization call. Um, a very important method is the fit method. So in the fit method, you yeah, fit the object before you can use it. So you, for example, after initializing it, call classifier dot um, fit on uh, using the features. So uh, X is the design matrix. So these are the features. So it's um, n, the, the shape is n training examples times uh, n features. Or you can also say m features, so we don't use the same letter twice. And then we have also a label array. So this is an array. It also has the shape n train. So this is just a vector, basically. Y is a vector. And then during the fitting, um, there will be certain attributes also assigned to the estimator. Yeah, and recall from the last video on the object-oriented programming paradigms, I explained that in scikit-learn, these fit attributes, so things that get created during or after calling fit, uh, are having this underscore here, this trailing underscore. So the, and there are additional attributes available only after fitting, and these are the ones with the uh, trailing underscore. Often you don't have to use them. Sometimes we will be using them in the class, but um, if you see something like an attribute with a trailing underscore, it means that it is an attribute created during model fitting. Yeah, then there's the predict method that you can use after calling fit. So you would then do classifier dot predict and here you can have let's say a new um, data set that has the same shape as your training data set so the same features but it could be let's say new examples that you haven't encountered during training it could be for example the test set so you can do predictions then um, and there's also a score method so the score method it depends on whether we have a classifier or a regressor in the case of a classifier the score method is just a convenience method for computing the accuracy, the classification accuracy. And for regressors, it's computing the um, R, R2, uh, the R squared, so the coefficient of determination. Yeah, and lastly, there are the private methods, the ones with the leading underscore. And these are the ones, in practice, you don't have to worry about. They mainly just exist to make the implementation of the code more efficient and more readable related to concepts of your yeah, code refactoring. So private methods you can kind of ignore. They are usually only used internally. And yeah, that is the main outline of a supervised estimator where we have the fit method, the predict method, the score method, and then sometimes also additional methods, but these are the main ones. Yeah, just as another way of looking at it, here's a flow chart outlining the scikit-learn estimator API or mainly the workflow. So um, after initializing an estimator, we would call fit. That's the first step, calling fit on, uh, using the training data. So this one will fit, fit the model. So we have then our fitted model. And then after we fitted the model, we can use uh, the test data set or any other new data set that has the same features as the training data uh, to make predictions. So then we can call predict and we get back labels. So that's just the main outline of how we can use an estimator. Yeah, here's an estimator in action again. So here I'm using the k-nearest neighbors classifier from the scikit-learn neighbors um, submodule. So scikit-learn organizes their code into submodules because otherwise it would be uh, yeah, kind of hard to maintain that library. So to make it a little bit more readable. So here we import the k-nearest neighbor classifier. And then I have a convenience function, ML extend for plotting decision regions. So what we are doing here is we are first initializing an estimator. And then after we initialize it, we can fit it to the training data like outlined in the previous slide. Uh, note that I'm only using two features here, uh, the feature the third feature and the fourth feature in the iris data set. So this is the iris data set, by the way. And um, that is just for, I would say, educational purposes, because you can only plot the decision regions uh, for two dimensions, because it's just the way of how um, yeah, we visualize things, because we can't really 
visualize higher dimensional um, scatter plots, right? So we can maybe visualize a 3D scatter plot, but everything beyond three dimensions would be hard to visualize. And even making a 3D plot on a 2D slide here would be kind of challenging for yeah, visual purposes. So here we are just using two features just for educational purposes. In practice, of course, you rarely have a data set with two features. Any case, so after fitting, we are calling this plot decision regions function um, to visualize that. And this is how it would look like. So here um, we have a decision region plot of the k-nearest neighbor classifier fit to the petal length and petal width. And note that the plot decision regions function internally would call um, predict to make the predictions basically. Yeah, and what you can see here is that the k-nearest neighbor classifier with three neighbors, um, I would say gets 100% accuracy here on this training set. So it's maybe even overfitting a little bit here. So what you can see is it can nicely separate out the blue squares from the triangles and circles. So I think uh, the blue squares, these were Setosa. Uh, red was Versicolor. And the green one was Virginica flowers. So you can see separating of Virginica and Versicolor is a little bit more tricky. Uh, here it's actually doing a good job with separating or catching this one. However, one might argue this is a little bit overfitting. So it could be um, if you have new flowers that uh, flowers in this region might be actually Virginica flowers. However, um, we will talk more about overfitting in later lectures. So yeah, this was it, a brief introduction to scikit-learn. In the next video, we will be taking a look at how we prepare the training set. So basically, we, uh, we will take a look at how we get X train and Y train from the iris data set, um, including techniques like uh, normalizing the data and um, yeah, pre-processing the data and stuff like that. So yeah, and with that, um, this video was just a short teaser using scikit-learn. In the next video, we will go into a little bit more detail.